the lecture tonight. My name is John Donaghy, and I'm Director of Campus Ministry at St. Thomas Aquinas, and also part-time lecturer in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies here. And I'm very happy to, to invite you to tonight's lecture. Um, uh, Father Michael Fahey is the Emmett Door Chair in Catholic Theology at Marquette University, and he's editor-in-chief of Theological Studies, which is one of the, the major theological journals in, in Catholic thought in the United States, probably the major one. Uh, and uh, he's also had a distinguished career, including being former dean and professor of theology at St. Michael's College in, in Toronto, and former president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. Uh, he has a doctorate from the uh, theology from the University of Tübingen in Germany, um, and he could probably tell you very many interesting stories about his professors, who included uh, Hans Kuhn and uh, 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 Ratzinger, uh, what's his first name? Joseph Ratzinger, who is now a cardinal. Uh, very interesting uh, variety of people. Uh, he teaches uh, sometimes, uh, although most of his work is, is in, in the editing and, and other work, he teaches mostly in ecclesiology and ecumenism. And in, and in his ecumenical work, has been doing work with uh, the U.S. Catholic Bishops Conference with the Orthodox Church in the United States. Uh, we're very happy to have him here tonight, um, sponsored by St. Thomas Aquinas, Church and Catholic Student Center um, uh, with some funding from the Monsignor Supple Endowment Fund. Um, we also are very grateful to the Committee on Lectures funded by GSB, which also has helped us in, in, in this. Uh, Father Fay uh, is a member of the Jesuits, uh, and he's going to speak to us. To, I want to add that in. I'm a graduate of a couple of Jesuit universities. And, uh, uh, but, I, but he's going to speak tonight in, on uh, salvation, who can be saved, a Catholic perspective. Let's all welcome uh, Father Fay. Good evening, and thanks for coming tonight. A um, little extra credit tonight, and uh, there'll be no quiz, though, at the end. Um, I'm looking forward very much to sharing with you some of these thoughts this evening, and I hope that we have a very fruitful exchange. I'm happy to be here this evening in Iowa. And um, I remember the day in the early 1940s, if you can believe it, when I first opened an atlas of the USA and I looked to find where Iowa was located. And the reason I did that was that my sister, Madeline, had volunteered to join the WAVES, the Women's Navy's uh, Auxiliary. And uh, she was assigned to Cedar Falls. And her weekly letters that she would write to the family described excursions to various places nearby, especially one special honor that she had to be invited to dinner in Waterloo at the home of the famous Sullivan family. You recall that um, during the war, the five Sullivan brothers, Joseph, Frank, Albert, Madison, and George all perished when their ship, the USS Juno, sank during the war. That was 1942. And to me, as a Connecticut lad, I said, I, I dream of the day that I'll get to Iowa, so here I am tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm especially grateful to those that invited me to offer here at Iowa State, this um, Monsignor James Supple lecture. And the topic, as you've heard, is salvation. Who is saved? A Catholic perspective. For the complete answer to the question, who is saved, please consult God. <laughs> Only God knows. And be prepared for an answer, something like, you'll find out when you get here. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have to be content with fitting together only some pieces of the picture puzzle in the hope of 
understanding the broad outline of the answer. So our purpose here this evening is not to enter into a debating match, nor to, for any one of us to attempt to understand completely what remains basically a mystery of divine providence. I collected my thoughts on the subject in the way that I know best, and namely, I had to do that as a Catholic theologian, but a Catholic theologian with ecumenical instincts, because since the 1960s, I've been involved in a series of profitable dialogue with other Christian churches, especially the churches of the Christian East, and more recently with representatives of several other major religious bodies. It's not surprising, therefore, that my theological reading of the question, who is saved, I interpret it this way. This is the way I understand the question. Who, after completion of life on this earth, can reasonably hope to enter definitively and joyously into eternal glory and to seek God face to face? That's the way I interpret the question. And I know that there are other ways of asking it. For instance, as I did some more reading to prepare for my talk, I came to recognize that especially for evangelical Christians, the question is understood differently. Brother, sister, are you saved? This typically refers more to the here and now, to one situation of individual conversion. Have you made a decision stirred by preaching and by response to the word of God here and now to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you been born again so that your much changed life will edify others and witness to your belief in the Lord? The evangelical formulation of the question suggests, I think, that the conversion moment is profoundly personal and palpable. It's something you can feel when it hits you. Whereas for most Catholics, being saved now means being in the state of sanctifying grace, as week by week one responds to one's baptism through communal worship at the Lord's Supper and through a moral life in conformity with the teachings of the gospel with only rare, palpable, sensible consolation. These two manners of understanding the question are ultimately and mutually not exclusive, although, as they say in the vernacular, it takes a while for the evangelical and the Catholic to understand where they're coming from. Catholics place less stress on an identifiable moment of conversion rather than on how his or her baptism and entry into the church gradually assimilated as one grows under grace and divine assistance in the midst of the church affects one. You will note, too, that my presentation sometimes shifts from a theoretical consideration of our ultimate salvation as Christians to a description of the missionary outreach to bring the gospel to other people. In my presentation, I quote some notable New Testament citations that I take to refer to the final glory, the moment of seeing God face to face. I also touch on various moments of church history, especially during the early church, some shifts that took place in the Middle Ages, some things that happened with the Age of Discovery when Europeans discovered that there was such a thing as North and South America. And finally, I give some 
authoritative texts that Catholics have formulated about that famous phrase, outside the church, there is no salvation. I hope to show that in recent years, say in the last two centuries, the question for Catholics about who, besides myself, is saved, has gradually been transformed into the question something like this. How does the Holy Spirit also operate outside the church in the lives of those persons created in the image and likeness of God, especially through other religions and ideologies, so that they too might be afforded entry into eternal life, into final glory. This raises the question whether certain absolute exclusivistic assertions made by Christians about no salvation outside the church are still valid. In other words, can other religions besides Christianity in and of themselves be vehicles of grace for the Holy Spirit? With new understandings of the human population of our planet and with less distorted readings of the world's other living faiths and with the goading by the Holy Spirit urging us to reflect on the piety and the worship of our neighbors, we've come to formulate the question of ultimate salvation somewhat differently today. Recently, the New York Times ran a full-page ad announcing that the award-winning novel by Ian Martell, a theology student, by the way, who studied at one of the schools that I taught at, Ian Martell's novel, The Life of Pi, has already sold a million copies. And it's extraordinary because it's a novel about a Hindu boy from India who becomes Christian and goes on to survive 260 days aboard a life raft in the company of a live 450 pound Bengal tiger. What a story. Prior to the oceanic adventure, the youngster by the name of Pai, after examining the beliefs of Hindus, Muslims, and Christians, seeks out a local Catholic priest and says, Father Martin, I would like to be a Christian, please. And the priest replied, You already are, Pai, in your heart. Whoever meets Christ in good faith is a Christian. Much of the success of that novel, I think, is resting on the light that it shows about the power of religion to bring about our salvation and even the salvation of our neighbor. Hollywood has a deservedly bad reputation for its stereotypical depiction such as the depiction historically of African Americans or Asians. Rarely do we see anything except simplistic portrayals of the values in other religions in Hollywood movies. So for the first time in my life, very recently, I was astounded to see a film, The House of Sand and Fog, in which the protagonist, played by Ben Kingsley, prays on his knees in a credible way to God as a pious Muslim, and he begs God to avert the tragedy of his son's death. I never saw anything like it when you compare the way that uh, Muslims, especially Arab Muslims, are portrayed in Hollywood films. The authentic faith of Islam in that film is not identified with distorted notions of jihad or self-emulation. So for our task tonight, I'd like to do five things. And um, I'd like to comment on several of those New Testament passages about the non-salvation 
of persons who are not born in Jesus Christ, to review what the early church said and did about non-Christians, to note some changes in the church's self-discovery, especially at the age of discovery, when uh, they discovered that the whole world was not centered around the Mediterranean, to observe the Christian missionary expansion in the 19th and 20th century, and finally to quote a few authoritative texts from the Catholic recent tradition. So let's see what we can do about some of those tough New Testament citations. Our study appropriately begins with several New Testament citations about the non-salvation of those not born again in Jesus Christ. Correctly interpreting those texts is not always easy. Some Christians consistently take these texts in a literal and no-nonsense approach, using principles of interpretation that other Christians consider fundamentalistic. These Christians draw severe practical conclusions from the text. And I'll give you an example. Several years ago, when I was associated with one of our theological consortiums, I met a professor of systematics from a sister institution who had just returned from a year's sabbatical in India. When I asked him how his sabbatical had been, he replied in terms deadly serious. I was depressed the whole time, he said, because I kept envisaging those poor creatures over there dying and going directly to hell. A few texts in the New Testament state categorically, even sometimes on the lips of Jesus, that there is only one exclusive way to salvation and that it is through faith in the Messiah and in the community of his faith. One such statement is Jesus' assertion, John 3, 5, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of faith, or is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Or again, in John's Eucharistic discourse, Jesus states, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person up at the last day. Also in Jesus' conversations with Nicodemus, he says, for God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son, <clears throat> the only son of God. At the end of Mark's Gospel, the apostles are mandated to evangelize the world in order to ensure humankind's ultimate salvation. Go into the whole world, proclaim the Gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, how are these dire and exclusionary texts to be interpreted? A Catholic approach to this challenging question is that no single biblical assertion can ever be interpreted in such a way that would contradict the totality and entire context of the Bible's Christian faith. If there seems to be a contradiction this is a sign that we need to reconsider the way we understand that particular scriptural passage. We are called upon to use all the means available to us, 
not only prayerful contemplation, but also the tools of rhetorical analysis, historical methods, to properly contextualize these difficult sayings. This holistic approach to interpreting one aspect of revelation is known as the appeal to the analogy of faith, which weighs seemingly contradictory statements against other truths of the faith and within the whole plan of revelation. Any formulation that promotes a thoroughly absolutist exclusionary understanding of who has access to salvation as Christian belief needs to be balanced off with the doctrine, which is likewise strongly affirmed in scripture, of God's universal salvific will. In other words, the belief that all men and women created in the image and likeness of God are destined for eternal bliss, for what is called the beatific vision. And this should make us cautious about affirming that only a minority of human beings reach beatitude. And if Christians are a minority, then only a minority would, according to that view, reach the beatific vision. One of the classic texts of asserting the universal salvific will of God is 1 Timothy 2, 3, 4. God, our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This conviction is further cited in the Pauline Corpus where Paul states, for example, for God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Or again, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Or as Paul said at another time, and Jesus died for all, that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Now we could spend the whole evening interpreting these and similar New Testament texts. If your church community supports these texts as thoroughly exclusionary, I doubt that any appeal of mine or my church will convince you of another interpretation. Even within one community of faith, there may be differences of opinion. What is important, I think, is that we treat the convictions of the other with respect, and that we at least envisage the possibility that the opposing conviction may be the correct one or even partially correct. I think that Protestants and Catholics would all assent to the conviction that the believing community as a whole, thanks to the assistance of the Holy Spirit, as we try to break open the word of God in scripture, is enlightened with a certain, what they call in theology, a sensus fidelium, an instinct among the believing community in a, uh, the whole community as a whole, an instinct for recognizing what is the ultimate meaning of a biblical passage that at first seems to be incompatible with other passages. Let me move on in part two to some experiences of the early church and how the early church faced the problem of salvation. What do we learn about the question who is saved from the practice and the writings of the early church? And by the early church, I mean the great and undivided church up to about the fourth century, up to the time when the age of persecution came to an end with the conversion of the Roman emperor. In fact, the early church 
showed little interest or concern about the salvation of pagans or Jews. If some of the church leaders, such as Cyprian, used phrases like extra ecclesium nulla salus, outside the church there's no such thing as salvation, he was not thinking of pagans or Jews. He was thinking exclusively of former Christians who had been thrown out of the church because of things they had done. The Christian community was intensely interested in its own individual and local regional churches and how they related to the worldwide church. When local groups of Christians came together, they had a great sense that they were part of a worldwide community, and by worldwide, they meant, you know, Mediterranean shore. And um, there was a great sense of the need to express somehow solidarity with one another of these churches. And how did they do it? The most obvious way and the clearest way that we can see is that they prayed for one another. Typical passage is reflected in the very early document, which is probably as old as John's Gospel, namely the Didache, where it says, this is the prayer, Remember, Lord, thy church, and gather it together in its holiness from the four winds unto your kingdom, which you have prepared for it. The early church had a tremendous sense of its solidarity with the other little churches sprinkled around the Mediterranean world. They also had a very interesting practice which began to emerge once the local church became too big to fit everybody into this little house church. The bishop would preside at the principal celebration of the Lord's Supper, but in other parts of the town, others, priests, would celebrate the Eucharist in other little houses, or how to express the unity among these different churches, even in one town. What they would do, the bishop would take a bit of the Eucharistic bread, the so-called fermentum, and he would break off a little piece of the bread before the communion service, and he'd hand it to the deacon, and the deacon would take this piece of the consecrated Eucharistic bread over to the other church, and he'd head into the church and drop that bread into the chalice or the cup where the wine was. And that symbolized the fact that that church was in communion with the other church. They weren't interested in what the pagan community were doing on a Sunday morning. They weren't interested in what was going on in the synagogue, but they sure were interested in what the other Christian communities were doing. They had other ways of expressing their unity through the exchange of letters, through the invitation to others, uh, other bishops to come at the moment when a bishop was going to be consecrated or ordained as a bishop and they'd get bishops from the neighboring churches to come and to be present and to impose hands at that time. There was a tremendous exchange of letters. They almost became sort of credit cards before the time. If you were going to be leaving Carthage and going to Rome, you would get a letter from your bishop that would say, this man who's holding this letter is a Christian in good community in my church, and when he gets to Rome, please put him up for free three nights at your house and feed him and take good care of him. No longer than three nights, though. And then after that, make sure that he can participate in the Eucharistic worship of your local church. There was all these exchanges of letters and prayers and gestures, but the early church did not stay awake nights worrying about who was saved and who was not saved. There was a whole different uh, way of looking at things. There was one notable example, however, 
And that, I think, you may have thought about yourself. One notable example was the, the great concern that the early Christians had for the ultimate salvation of non-community members who had preceded them in death and died before the Messiah. So that would include, for instance, the father of Jesus, Joseph, uh, the patriarchs, David, Solomon, Esther, Ruth, all these holy people of the um, Old Testament. Did these people get saved? What was their fate? What happened when they died if they hadn't been baptized in Christ? Were they part of the communion of the redeemed? And what happened was they worked out a theory that these people went to a place called limbo. Not the limbo for little babies, but the limbo for the grown-ups. And they all stayed there waiting in anticipation until the moment that Jesus died on the cross and his soul descended into limbo and spent the three days with them announcing the fact that he had now died to reopen the gates of heaven and that at the moment of ascension all of these souls, all of these bodies would be raised up again and introduced into paradise. And there was great rejoicing in the fact that these people who had died before the death of Christ would ultimately reach paradise through this gesture of Christ. That was about as much interest as they showed in some of the other persons. I'd now like to kind of jump over. This is something that I tell my students don't ever do, but I do it myself occasionally. And that is I'm going to jump over 700 years of church history. And I'm going to talk not so much about the early church, but the late medieval church and uh, the church of the age of discovery. And I think you'll begin to see some changes. We now had a period of about 125 years when the churches of the West decided that they wanted to get back the Holy Land for themselves. They wanted to get rid of the Muslims, they wanted to get rid of any residue Jews that were still there that had not emigrated elsewhere. And uh, they had a whole series of wars against the Holy Land and against these infidels. The purpose was supposed to be religious, but it very rapidly became an economic and political thing. And at the time of this, they actually destroyed some of the Eastern Orthodox churches in places like Constantinople. And uh, it wasn't all a religious, as you know from your courses in history, it wasn't all a religious event. From that period of time, there emerged some notoriously triumphalistic assertions about the church. And you think that some of those statements in the New Testament were exclusionary. Wait till you hear what some of these popes had to say about who could get into heaven. These declarations, though, which I'll cite in a minute, were not intended to apply primarily to the Jews or to the pagans but they were intended to apply to Christians who had become heretics, whether they were Albigensians, whether they were Pelagians, whatever they were. These are statements to scare these people. Pope Innocent III said, okay, you Waldensians, if you want to become a member of the Christian church again, remember this. We believe in our hearts and confess with our lips that there is one church, not that of the heretics, but the holy, catholic, and apostolic church outside of which there is no salvation. See what he's done? 
Shortly thereafter, at a council presided over by the same pope, he uh, made the language even stronger by saying not just no one, but no one at all. There is one universal church of the faithful outside of which no one at all is saved. And Boniface VIII, the pope, in a document in the 13th century said, we are obliged by our faith to believe and hold that there is one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We declare and state and define that every human creature, for every human creature it is a matter of strict necessity for salvation to be subject to the Roman pontiff. Now that's raising the stakes even higher. It's not just the Catholic Church, but it's the Roman pontiff. Papal assertions such as these are of questionable import, but they have hung around, they hovered over the Catholic Church and shaped its catechesis, its teaching, for many, many years and many centuries. It's not surprising that in modern times, even in my lifetime, when I was growing up in New England, that we had this famous priest, Father Leonard Feeney, who was a Boston priest, a poet, a chaplain at Harvard University. And um, every Sunday when he went to preach at the Boston Common Garden in the park there, he hammered away at this teaching. Outside of the Catholic Church, there's no salvation. And this is, applies especially to you Jews. And um, eventually, his preaching, which was based on those texts of the earlier popes, got him into so much trouble that he was excommunicated for teaching a doctrine that was erroneous. And the Roman Church came out at that time and said, you don't have to be a member of the church in re, in reality. The most you need is to be a member of the church in voto. That is to say, by a kind of a desire to do whatever you need to do to lead the good life. Now there are obvious problems with that interpretation, but at least the Catholic Church at that time in, in my lifetime was seeing that there were all sorts of problems with the way that that text was being applied to people about who is saved and who is not saved. When the new world was discovered, so-called discovery of the new world, although it had been there for a long time, the, the shock for Europeans about the extent of the population of North and South America was, was staggering for them because they now realized there were hundreds of thousands of people that had never heard of Jesus Christ. And they began to think, well, what about them? Maybe we should do something. So even Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand during the explorations of uh, Christopher Columbus made sure that there were priests on board so that when they got there, they could start this important task of converting the American natives. There was a gradual shift in understanding about the importance of this. And you have to wonder whether these Christians, led by their clergy, had any positive attitude towards the religion of the native people of North and South America when they got here. Did they really think that the Holy Spirit had been operating in these people for centuries, teaching them how to pray, teaching them how to lead the good life, teaching them the values of family and uh, adoration? Or did these people come and say, they have had absolutely nothing up to now, and we will now bring them for the first time the truths of the, the one true religion. If I had more time, I'd like to go into some examples of some of these famous missionaries, such as Matteo Ricci, 
who went to China, Francis Xavier, who uh, preached in India and in Japan, uh, the example of Jean de Brébeuf, who worked among the Huron people of our own continent, and even wrote Christmas carols in the, the Huron language for these people. Or people like Bartolome de las Casas, who uh, organized the missionary outreach in Latin America. These people, if you look at them closely, actually had a growing appreciation for the fact that they were not starting their missionary work from zero, that Holy Spirit had been there for centuries and had gotten a lot of things accomplished. They were building, therefore, on what had been done by these other persons. With the arrival of the 19th and 20th century, what shifted now was that the method of transportation was so much easier that it was pretty easy to go by a steamship from Europe to, north, to other parts of the world. I have relatives that uh, go back to England who were Methodists, and they took off in the 19th century to go from London to New Zealand to evangelize the Maori people. It took them over two and a half months to get to Auckland. With the arrival of new means of transportation, with the opening of the Suez Canal and all these other developments, it was now possible to move very rapidly and to establish through missionary societies and through missionary congregations all sorts of outreach that had not been uh, possible before. Now, they made their mistakes when some of the British missionaries arrived in the Pacific Islands. They were quite shocked by the fact that the uh, sexual libido of the Pacific Islanders was so notable. And they said uh, these people need not only the gospel, but they need a good antidote to libido through the drinking of tea, that this would be a big help for them. And uh, that's one example of inculturation gone awry. <laughs> there was a, a growing understanding at that time that um, the people in the Americas and the people in Europe had to reach out towards the people in Africa and the people of Asia. And um, we have quite a lot of identification in the outreach and the evangelical work of our missionaries. Some of it was perhaps mistaken, but some of it was very profound indeed. I'd like to bring this section before our question period to a close by just quoting a section from a modern Roman Catholic event that we're proud of as theologians because it tried to bring into focus the best of our critical thinking about the salvation of others and uh, it's how it is brought about by the Holy Spirit. The um, document of Vatican II on the relation of the church to non-Christian religions stated, the Catholic Church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these non-Christian religions. It has a high regard for the manner of life and conduct the precepts and the doctrines, which, though differing in many ways from its own teaching, nevertheless often reflect a ray of that truth which enlightens all men and women. Yet it proclaims, and it is in duty bound to proclaim without fail, Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Now that kind of language and the presuppositions behind it 
is quite refreshing. It's open to humble and, um, and different interpretations, certainly, than what we saw at an earlier period of time. When, after the council, they decided that they would formulate in perhaps even simpler language in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, published in English in 1994, the first thing it said was, how are we to understand the affirmation outside the church there is no salvation? An affirmation often repeated by the church fathers. Reformulated positively, it means that all salvation comes from Christ the head through the church, which is his body. Basing itself on scripture and tradition, the council teaches that the church, a pilgrim now on earth, is necessary for salvation. That Christ is present to us in his body, which is the church. He himself explicitly asserted the necessity of faith and baptism, and thereby affirmed at the same time the necessity of the church, which men enter through baptism as through a door. However, those who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart and moved by grace try in their own actions to do his will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience, these too may attain eternal salvation. There are a number of things that I haven't had a chance to touch on. One of them, which would make an interesting talk